Good afternoon, everybody. It's great, really great to welcome you all to this special service today as we gather to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the laying of the foundation stone of St. Mary's Church, in whose footprint, albeit there aren't many walls left, but in whose footprint we sit today. My name's Paul, I'm the vicar of this parish at the moment, though I'm aware we have, uh, we have Margaret and Anne here, whose father was vicar back in the 1940s, is that right? So it's great to have you with us as well. I'm delighted to welcome the Mayor and Mayoress to this service and look forward to hearing from the Mayor later on. But of course we welcome, and of course with no disrespect to those who have gone before, just as importantly we welcome Alan and Pat who were married here some years ago. Won't say how many because I don't know. <laughs> But we've got the family of Ada and Albert here, who were married here 83 years ago. I've already mentioned Margaret and Anne. Uh, we've got Greg over there, who is involved in a long, long list of things here in this church, both her and her mother. I think you're on, was it Deanery Synod? Bell ringing? Yeah, all those things and more. And I know we've got representatives of people like Margaret Chapman, who can't be here today, but who rang the bells in this place. And so there's a lot of people here today with very deep connections to this building, to this place, to the worship that took place here, for whom I'm sure today will be bringing up all kinds of emotions and memories. So welcome to you all. As we come together, we're going to begin by praying. So let us pray. Lord God, receive our praise and thanksgiving for the blessings, help and comfort which you bestowed on your people in this place from its foundation. We gather today looking back to see paths taken, looking forward to see our path. We honor those who have gone before us. We celebrate who we are today and we welcome the possibilities and opportunities before us. We gather to worship you, the God of yesterday, today and tomorrow. Continue, we pray, your many mercies in your church, that we may be conscious at all times of your unchanging love for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Written in 1834 by Henry Francis Light, just as it happens, at the point when the Reverend Andrew Knox became the second vicar of this church. Our first hymn that we're about to sing in a moment would have been a brand new one for that congregation. And I wonder how new hymns were received by the church back then, whether there was as much cynicism and battle as there is today, I don't know. But now this has become one of our nation's favorite hymns and it's a very appropriate one for, day, for today. It reflects the Hopeful words of Psalm 103, words of God's love and care to our forefathers and to us today. So can I invite you to stand if you're able as we sing together and the words are on your order of service. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. No, you have to stand up.
Would you like to be seated? And so we gather here in what are now some very well-preserved remains of St. Mary's Church, which, as we've touched on, most of you will know and remember far better than I. But of course, we're sitting the wrong way round, as I was chatting with someone before the service. You technically should be facing the other way, as the altar was at the other end of the church, down by the car park. However, better we sit this way today, so that we can see the walls of the church that stood here for some 158 years. It was in 1818 that the Lord of the Manor, Francis Richard Price, decided to build this church at his own expense, with the foundation stone being laid on this day in 1819, exactly 200 years ago. And the first service was held in December of 1822. And at that time, this 90 foot long and 50 foot wide church enjoyed fine views over the River Mersey, which you can still get from the top of the tower, but not quite so much from down here now. And I believe you would have been looking out at fields all around here. How the times have changed. The local population at the time was around 200 people, but growing. Hence, in uh, the 1830s, the addition of two transepts to the church building. By the time the Reverend Canon Andrew Knox, perhaps the most notable, unless they're part of the family, the most notable of the vicars of this church, by the time he died in 1881, the population had grown to around 80,000 and it was still growing. Birkenhead was booming. And so many years went by with this church impacting the life of the community that was grow growing around it in many different ways. However, as we move forward in 1970 or in the 1970s, the building was declared unsafe and closed in 1971. And in 1977, all but the remaining tower and west walls, which we see today, were demolished. But, as with any church, it is the people that tell the story. And while this building holds many, many memories of significant events and precious times for many of us, it's the people who build the legacy. A dynamic, passionate, proactive, spirit-filled people that reaches out in faith and love to those around. And so it is appropriate that I now hand over to Tony Hughes, a dedicated volunteer at this place, far more knowledgeable about it than I will ever be, but who has his own and his family's own personal connection to this church, but I'll let him tell you about that. So over to you, Tony. As Paul said, uh, and I make no apologies for this, I'm going to talk about my grandparents, Mary and Thomas Jones. They were staunch members of the church my grandmother actually was a staunch member of the um, Mother's Union. She loved the theatrical side of the church. As the two girls would know, Canon Lee's daughters, it was a very active church with regards to the sale of work, all the pantomimes that took place. My grandfather also was a member of the church he was the caretaker of the church after Mr. Mann, and consequently he looked after the church, he looked after the church grounds, he also looked after the church hall. The church hall was part of the church after the amalgamation between St. Mary's and St. Paul's in the 1940s. I would also like to, while I'm standing here, welcome the mayor and the mayoress, as you well know, um, being the parish church of Birkenhead, 
but most of the services held here, mo memorial or mayoral services, they were um, very, very often, because in those days, I've just spoken to the mayor of Wirral, we had a mayor of Birkenhead. And the mayor of Birkenhead, he was positioned in the hub of the town, which is the town hall. Now, in those days, of course, any uh, services relating to the mayor always used to be held here. I would also like to talk about two ladies who are here today. These two ladies are the, the daughters of the vicar of Kenneth Lee. Uh, Kenneth Lee was here between 1947 and 1951, I believe. Um, when Kenneth Lee arrived, um, he was instructed by the, um, the, the bishop, because they came from Crewe, he was instructed to close one of two churches. That was the Church of St. Mary or the Church of St. Paul. Now, some of you may know or may not know, but St. Paul's Church used to be on the corner of Market Street and Argyle Street. It was known as the Workman's Church. And after the war, with all the blitz, of course, it had no vicar. The vicar before Kenneth Lee was a chap named Mr. Petherbridge, and Mr. Petherbridge's job was one week he would hold a service in the church here, and then he would move over to St. Paul's the following week. My grandmother and my grandfather were married in St. Paul's, and so was my mum and dad married in St. Paul's. However, when Kenneth Lee was instructed to come here and close one of the churches. The church wardens at St. Paul's decided that they would make his life easy. And it was decided that they would close St. Paul's church. And after they sold St. Paul's church, the, um, the church hall, which is down by um, Central Station, became part of St. Mary's Church as well, as well as the, the um, vicarage. Now, Paul did hit on um, Canon Knox. Um, Canon Knox, as you well know, was the first canon of the church. As a matter of fact, it's recorded on the internet that Canon Knox was the first vicar of the church. He wasn't. It was Mr. Newton who was the first vicar. But as Paul said, he became the first, the second uh, vicar of, uh, of the church in, 19, in 1834. Now, just before 1834, as the curate, he also was responsible for the building of uh, part of the church, the North Transept. And two years after he became vicar, he was responsible for building the South Transept. One of his greatest friends, of course, was John Laird. Now, when John Laird died in 1874, the township of Beckett had virtually turned out for that particular funeral. And during that time, thousands of people lined the streets between Hamilton Square, where John Laird lived, and the church itself. The service was uh, conducted by Canon Knox, although he wasn't a Canon Knox in those days, he was the reverend. He wasn't a canon till he was made honorary canon of Chester Cathedral, just prior to his death in 1881. The burial place of both two men are here in the grounds of the cloister. And before I end, I would like to talk about the bell ringers. We had a lovely peal of bells. I've met up with three bell ringers in the last few weeks, one of which was a lady named Margaret Chapman. She was a bell ringer in 1938. She's quite frail, she's 96, but her sister is here today. Um, if you do happen to get hold of the memories of St. Mary's, which we've had produced, most of it had been produced by Margaret Chapman. A lady of 96 had a memory of an elephant 
it took three hours. We, we interviewed her for over three hours, five sheets of A4, and then she had to edit it. She was absolutely brilliant. Uh, another bell ringer was a chap named Ernie Carvel. Ernie Carvel can't be here today. Unfortunately, two months ago, he stumbled and broke his arm. Now, Ernie Carvel, I understand, up to that stage, and I've spoken to you, Anne, he still rings bells, or he's still ringing bells. He's 90 in November. Another gentleman rang me up yesterday, and he turned around and said, I saw the advert in the paper, or the piece in the paper, and I was a bell ringer, and I said, well, how old are you? I'm 92. And he goes reeling off all the people that he knew. We were on the phone for a half an hour. It was unbelievable. When you come to think, you know, these, when we heard those bells, and it was Ernie Carvel who actually gave me the recording, which we are, are able to put on this. When you come to think that although this church, this wonderful church, the building is gone, when I look around at the moment, the spirit's still there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. So if you want longevity, ring bells, I think. <laughs> so let's give thanks. We come together today, amongst everything else, to give thanks, don't we? To give thanks for those who established this congregation for their faith, their vision, for the brave and believing people and ministers who brought God's message to this place, for all who have been members of this congregation, for those who over the years have freely given of their time, their money, their gifts, for those whose wisdom has guided this church throughout its years. And so we're going to give thanksgiving in prayer and we're going to use the prayer of thanksgiving from the Book of Common Prayer, which I am sure would have been used regularly in services held in this church throughout the years. And so let us pray to give thanks to God. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. How amazing that after all these years, there's still some of us here who can join in with that, without the words in front of us. Bless you. I'm now going to hand over to Frank Campbell, who works here at the Priory site, uh, and he's going to bring us a Bible reading from Genesis chapter 28. taken from Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 through to 19 Jacob's dream at Bethel Meanwhile Jacob left the sheep and travelled toward Haran At sundown he arrived at the 
a good place and set up a camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone for a pillow and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamt of a stairway that reached from earth to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down on it. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are laying on belongs to you, and I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the air. They will cover the land from east to west and from north to south. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I will be with you and I will protect you wherever you go. I will someday bring you safely back to this land and I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. Then Jacob woke up and said, Surely, the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other in the house of God, the gateway to heaven. The next morning, he got up very early. He looked at the stone he had used as a pillow and set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. And he named the place Bethel, House of God. Amen. So Jacob receives a promise from God as he sleeps. The gift of land, a growing population, a people of blessing. So are we talking about Jacob and his descendants or St. Mary's church? Perhaps both. Surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it, said Jacob after he awoke. in some ways an unassuming place where many might find themselves for a variety of reasons, but where the presence of God is felt in a powerful, often unexpected way. So again, are we talking about Jacob or are we talking about here? Before he moves on, Jacob builds an altar and he calls the place Bethel, house of God. So a place where God dwells, a place of meeting with God, of hospitality, a place of welcome, a place of family. We talk about Jacob and we talk about St. Mary's Church. This building, even if just a small part of it remains now, is important. It is a physical testimony to how we and those who have gone before us have encountered God. It's a physical reminder of our faith history. And of course, it sits in the wider site of the Priory, whose faith history goes back even further and even deeper. Jacob built that altar that day as a witness to his encounter with God. And we have these parts of this building to continue to speak to us, but also so that we can speak of it. Through it, we remember and we retell the story of our faith as a means of keeping it alive and real. What is your story of faith connected to this place, I wonder? How do these bricks and ironworks revolutionary in their time 
give root to our faith in Jesus Christ and our own encounters with him. But of course, we're not limited to buildings, nor have we ever been, nor has the church ever been. As we go into the New Testament, the picture of God's dwelling place on earth changes from physical places to physical people. Peter, in the New Testament, talks of followers of Jesus being living stones, the building blocks of this spiritual house where God dwells. And so it is in us who build our lives on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. It's in us that God chooses to make his home. And so it's through us, the living stones, that the story of faith goes on today which is why it's so important that Tony shared with us this afternoon about the people of this church. This building may only now be here in part. We may mourn the loss of the rest. We may look back wistfully to what once was. But God says, even so, here we have a reminder, a reminder that while no building will last forever, Though the chapter house is making a good effort at it. No building will last forever, but the church of God will. Built by the master builder out of living stones, continuing to grow and bless and find God in new ways. And so as we come together today, we can look forward with hope as much as we look back at our memories and shared experiences here. How will God continue to use us to build his kingdom of love and mercy and justice here in the world today? How do these memories today inspire us to walk forward in faith, trusting in the promises of God as he continues to build his church in the world? May each of us today know God's spirit filling us as God's living stones that we may witness to God's timeless love for the world, his presence in the world, both for today and for each of our tomorrows as they come. And now I am delighted to hand over to the Mayor of Wirral, Councillor Tony Smith, as he comes to share with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, Tony, that was really interesting, the history of the, uh, the church and that. First of all, thank you um, very much for um, inviting the, the Lady Mayoress and myself to uh, this wonderful event. Um, when um, mine is to sort of look forward to what's going to happen in the future, but um, if you look at Birkenhead, and you all know it has a rich history um, in faith and in industry and development, and uh, this site and the area around it bears witness to this. Uh, the town of Birkenhead adopted the motto Ubi Fides, Ibi Lux et Robo. Where there is faith, there is light and strength. Unbelievably, I actually did a Latin A level, and it's about the first time in 40 years that I actually used the la a Latin phrase. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a nice experience. Um, yeah, this site has roots into the history of Birkenhead and the experiences of those who've gone before. Um, in this particular uh, service, we're looking backwards in the church service over the people and events that have taken place on the Priory for nearly 500 years and in the church for 200, which makes it so special to those who will be present today and those who will say about this place and about this community and about Birkenhead. 
and the priory in common with the, uh, the town of Birkenhead and the wider world community has had its ups and downs over the centuries with people of vision and passion stepping in at the right time to bring it back, raise it back up and to give it a sense of purpose and identity. We all know that the recent history of world has been one of mixed fortunes which has exacerbated the social and economic contrast between parts of the world. There are affluent communities interspersed with open rural areas and pretty villages. Other, other areas have not fared so well. The decline began in the 1960s, resulting in physical deterioration, lack of investment, rising unemployment, and a wide range of deprivation problems. It is against this background that the Council is targeting its regeneration throughout the borough and focusing inward investment in Birkenhead. Um, I just want to mention very briefly um, um, an innovative giant uh, venture which is called the World Growth Company which will drive new leisure, residential and business development throughout the borough. This is a um, World Growth Company is a 50-50 partnership between World Council and Urban Regeneration Specialist News Division, News Development. And thankfully, one of the first areas of focus um, for the company will be a new development in Birkenhead Town Centre, where plans for development could include a new business district, high quality offices, alongside leisure space, an improved market and extensive public realm improvements, creating a revitalized town center. But what, what is actually happening right now? Well, this year is the uh, world, is the borough of culture year for world, world in the uh, Liverpool city region. We're all way, all, almost halfway past that particular stage, and already it's been an incredible year with more than 100,000 people immersing themselves in events, exhibitions, and creative projects, including the magnificent forest photography exhibition taking place in Birkenhead Priory right now. There's a lot more to look forward to this, this year, including the Food and Drink Festival, the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra concert in Birkenhead Park, the tour of Britain Cycling and the River of Light work Fireworks Spectacular. Together, all of these planned, planned events are expected to engage 500,000 people by the end of the year, which will be a magnificent achievement. But Borough of Culture is a unique opportunity to shine a light on world's wonderful heritage, natural assets and creative pedigree and will help showcase the contribution, the arts, the culture and heritage make to the local economy and everyone's quality of life. Also, sporting and cultural events, often beautiful heritage locations, such as this particular location, Port Sunlight or Birkenhead Park, are making our borough of culture year one to remember and continuing to put world on the map. Um, we want to make sure a borough of culture year will have a huge positive impact for the, our children and young people and our local community, not just in 2019, but in the years to come. So, if you haven't had an opportunity yet, and I'm not advertising here, but about six, eight weeks ago, the mayoress and myself were down at Woodside, uh, Woodside Ferry Village, which opened it's got a, a beautiful setting there, magnificent setting over the River Mersey. If you ever want to go down for coffee or tea or a sandwich or whatever, it's a lovely location, particularly during the summer months, an opportunity to bring family, family members or visitors from other places and that. But uh, we're absolutely delighted to be here today. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, indicate some of the areas we are trying to uh, build up here on the world. So thank you very much.
thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for taking us from the present, looking into the future. How do we continue to build together? And so now we're going to have a short time of prayer as we commit ourselves to continue to work towards a better future, building on the foundations that have been laid before for us. As we pray, at the end of each prayer, I will say the words, Lord, hear us, and you may wish to respond, Lord, hear us and help us. And so let us pray. God of our lives, when Jacob encountered you at Bethel, he built an altar as a witness to that meeting. May each of us be alert for your activity in the world. And may our own worship today and each day reflect your encounters with us in our own lives. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us and help us. God of the world, the people of Israel carried a tent to house the Ark of the Covenant and your Holy Spirit. May our faith travel with us beyond this place and into every aspect of our lives, that we may be agents of change and transformation in the world around us. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us and help us. God of all time, our forebears in faith built this church as a sign of their devotion and service to you. May our vision for today and for the future honour those who have paved our way to you. May we look to the future with imagination and faith, confident in your guiding and provision. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us and help us. Today, Lord, you call us to be living stones, your church in the world. May our worship, our faith, our vision overflow with your love, mercy and justice, so that we may be living proof of your life in us and in the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us and help us. And as we commit ourselves to seeking God's kingdom in the world, we join to break together in the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together the Lord's Prayer in the traditional version. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen And so can I thank you all very much for coming to this service this afternoon and just to invite you up to the refectory uh, for refreshments following on from this service uh, and to enjoy the display that has been put together there um, reflecting the history of St Mary's Church and after our final prayer of blessing again we will hear the bells of St Mary's playing to us. And so may the Father from whom every family in earth and heaven receives its name strengthen you with his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Oh,